By the way, you want uh, the false prophet I saved that in Fish Out Ministries. You know they blocked off the website before the beast. The bastards are coming. By the way, this cannot be a American government because why would they block off that website? Not Google. They blocked off. Today I couldn't have wanted to print out from that one. So I typed out Fish House Ministry, I went to their website. Then I got this for you. But when I got my copy, I went through Behold the Beast. But they blocked it off today. Today I couldn't get access. But Google is blocking a lot of Christian websites. A lot of Christian stuff on YouTube has been blocked. A lot. One guy uh, who was trying to expose Barack Obama, American government atrocities, and all that. You know they took away 57 of his videos. And then uh, his lawyer, uh, he wanted to ask YouTube, you got someone internally. And the guy sent an email, he showed the email, but blocked off the guy's name, the one that insider source in Google says, they're going to do this now. They're killing people's stuff, they're killing the, the evidence. So now uh, you'll find a lot of videos about the Pope and all that are going to be deep stuff. That's why it's good, uh, if let's say when you all got time. Good, I can access. Hmm? I can access. But we cannot take anything for granted because we don't know how these barriers will react. Yeah, okay, let's go. But the point is this, uh, let's begin. Mm-hmm. But what we're going to say is that for now, uh, we've got to also be very careful because when the hour of trial comes, there'll be a lot of blackout on news. So we've got to keep in touch which, whichever videos we can find, uh, whichever networks you can find during this running, uh, we must be prepared. Uh, one more time, chapter 9. They shall come and be you know the day Jews. And with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way. Rivers of waters is what? Remember? I told you all. Peoples, right? So I will make them walk straight way, wherein they will not stumble from the father, a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn, Jeremiah 31 9. I like the way Alice Schofield quotes Bible verses in the beginning of this chapter. That's why when I did my own revelation, right, if you actually see my book stuff, I actually quoted, you know. Deep in the mountainous interior of Irian Jaya, now it's in the nature, formerly Dutch New Guinea, there lives a tribe of people, a tribe of natives called the Yalu. They were one of the most isolated peoples in the face of the earth, yet they had a very formalized blood sacrificial system. They had a lot of Ten Commandments called them the Win Malalek. Sorry, Wen. Because Indonesia is Wen. It's Japanese. Wen Malalek. And a holy ground called the Osuwa. That Osuwa was surrounded by a stone wall. Any man not consecrated by the spirits of Kumbu or any woman who trespassed the ground would be killed. Within the Osuwa was a second building called the Kumbu Wam. Kumbu Wam. You had two rooms, an outer room where the priest of Kumbu Wam held ceremonies. You know something before I go on? You know of the inner room, outer room? The temple the, of God. Yeah. So they copied the temple of God. You got it? If you read it carefully, you get it? Because remember the temple of God, the Jewish priest, right? Yeah. The priest, only the, the main high priest could enter the most holy of holies. Okay? And an inner room which was held by a sacred stone. The stone was never allowed to be moved by one man, but had to be carried by four men on its corners. Guess what? Remember the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was carried by how many? Four priests. Remember they were carrying it on their shoulders, right? And the four priests were carrying it. Pigs were slaughtered. Actually it should be sheep, but they can't find sheep in Indonesia, so they went for sheep, pigs. And roasted in the court outside the Kampu Vam. Guess what? They roasted the they roasted the sheep, the blood of the lambs the fat of the goats outside the most holy of holies go read it in Leviticus and priests with awesome ceremony to pick fat into the holiest of rooms and anointed the sacred stone through its blood guess what isn't that what the Jews do a more detailed account of the Yalu folk religion may be found in John Richardson you can find this online by the way you don't have to read the whole book online I mean it's too many pages we're coming to the end but you can find it online you find their e-books uh, or certain links and what you can do is just go out to page 76 to 80 now let's go to the next one. It gets more interesting. This is even better still. Though unbelievably corrupted, of course it is because of the pigs, the parallels of the Leal food religion to the Levitical code are so inescapable that one has to ask, where did they get all that? Do you get the point? So far, so clear, right? In Burma, there was a tribe of people called the Karen who worshipped the god Yahweh. Their prophets declared that they once possessed the book of the law. Remember, Moses? and had lost it many centuries before. Okay? 
Sacred songs passed down for generation to generation we remember the the Lord's law. Omnipotent is Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh is Yahweh. Right? Got it? And omnipotent, why? Right? We have an omnipotent God. Him have we not believed. The Jews turned away from Him, remember? Yahweh created man in ancient in Genesis. He has a perfect knowledge of all things. God does. Yahweh created man at the beginning. So they did it in Genesis. The earth is the treading place for the feet of Yahweh. This is exactly what the Bible says. The heaven and heaven is the place where He sits. God is sitting in heaven right now. He sees all things and we are manifest to Him. Isn't this what the Bible says? Yahweh formed the earth originally. Yes, He did. And appointed food and drink. He appointed the fruit of trial. Guess what? The fruit of trial means the tree of knowledge, remember? Mukali deceived two persons. Satan deceived Adam and Eve, remember? We caused them to eat of the fruit of the tree of trial. Adam and Eve was made to eat. They obeyed not, they believed not Yahweh. Okay, they became subject to sickness, aging, and death. Isn't this what exactly happened to Adam and Eve? O children and grandchildren, if we repent of our sins and cease to do evil or restraining our passions, that's what we are told to do in the Bible. And pray to Yahweh, He will have mercy on us again. If Yahweh does not have mercy on us, there is no one else who can. Isn't this exactly what we read in the Psalms sometimes? He who saves us is the only one, Yahweh. O children and grandchildren, grandchildren, pray to Yahweh constantly by day and night. Don Richardson, eternity, the hearts, case sites from the gospel in Burma, gospel in Burma, Wiley, the Karen apostle. Look at all the words they use. Doesn't this look familiar to you? Okay, now, next page. Yahweh is just too close to Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God, to be coincidental. And what about the fruit of trial and prayer? These traditions do not appear to be founded in the New Testament gospel, but upon the knowledge of the Old Testament. Again, we have to ask, where did they get all that? The Lahu of Northern Burma and the tradition of Kuesha, the creator of all things, had given their forefathers his law written on rice cakes. The Rungma tribe in India believed that the Supreme Being gave his words to their forefathers written on animal skins, which by the way is what the Mosaic law was written on, papyrus. Okay? Got that so far? Okay? But according to their traditions, the forefathers of the Rungma people had been careless with their skins and dogs had dogs eating them, okay? So, you see, these examples are not unique. The native religions of almost every isolated people are cutting haunting memories in very detail of an earlier knowledge of the true God or of His law. So once again we ask, where did all this knowledge come from? To find out, we need to go back again to the history of the children of Israel. Jacob named Israel for the Lord, who was Abraham's grandson. Jacob had 12 sons, among whom was Joseph. And those 12 men became the fathers of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. After the death of Jacob, Israel's 12 tribes remained in Egypt for 430 years. They fled Egypt in 1446 BC and were in the wilderness for another 40 years. After Joshua's conquest of Canaan, they lived in the Promised Land under Judges for another 300 years. Then during the judgeship of Samuel, the people demanded to have a king. God first to get him Saul, then David, and then David became the line of kings to which Jesus would be born. But the kingdom remained ununified for only two generations. If you read the account carefully, it appears that Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had a son who was truly inept. Actually inept. The Hobom's decision to raise taxes caused a revolt, so then rank that the Davidic kingdom divided. God separated Judah and Benjamin from the ten northern tribes, and the twelve tribes became two separate nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. God as of our Old Testament. Jerry mentioned the capital of Judah while Samaria became the capital of Israel. Now when they ask who is my brother, I always tell you all. When the Jews, no, the disciples of Jesus ask who is my brother, what do you say? Samaritans. Who is Samaritans? From Samaria. So who is he talking about? The Israelites. So this idea that you must love your neighbor as yourself, as we got to love the heathen as ourselves, is total nonsense. So tonight, I think we can all shake hands. I mean, metaphorically. We now know that we don't have to shake hands with those who worship the beast. We don't have to kiss babies we should worship the beast. We don't have to do whatever, okay? So get that one straight. Northern Israel remained in continual rebellion to the law, putting in country with Judah and the nations around them. Finally, in 748 BC, Tikla, the lesser of East Syria, made Northern Israel a vassal state in the capital of Assyria. In 725 BC, Shalmaneser began a major deportation of Israel and put Samaria under siege. Samaria itself fell in 72 BC 
and what was left of the non nation of Israel was taken captive. And the dead near the Caspian Sea, north of what is now Iran. And they were never heard from again. This happened just as Moses prophesied over. Nehemiah 1 8. Remember, I besieged him. The word thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Why did God ever allow this to happen? Were the Israelites not part of God's chosen people? Didn't the everlasting covenant God made with Abraham include the ten tribes? The prophet Isaiah saw what was going on around him and lamented. Isaiah 63, 17, O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and harden our hearts from thy fear? Return for thy servants' sake the tribes of thine inheritance. The fall of northern Israel was not just an unfortunate incident in history. It was an integral part of God's eternal plan. And the Lord told his people about it in advance. Now, this one, I'm so glad I read this because it cleared up what I read in Hosea. Hosea was placed in Israel just before his fall. He alone details the future of the ten tribes after their dispersion among the Gentile nations. Hosea prophesied from about 750 to 750 BC and he prepares God's people for the calamity that is about to fall them. Read the prophet carefully and you will see that the destruction of Israel and Samaria is fixed. It is going to fall to Assyria no matter what. Hosea is not a call to repentance to save the northern kingdom. Instead, the prophet is describing the Lord's plan for the ten kingdoms, ten tribes, after they disappear. You got it after. He showed the ten tribes. Now let's look at this graph number 13, Leviticus 26, 20, 32, 33. And I will bring the two, the land into desolation, your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at it. I scatter you among the heathen, and I will draw a sword after you, and your land shall be left desolate, and your cities waste. So this is a map you can follow up later for yourself. In the verse below, we begin to see the everlasting God, love our Heavenly Father, has faced way with Israelites. While they were freaking out ways to rebel against him, God was putting a long-term plan in motion to save them, a plan spanning thousands of years. The following verse is in that setting. Israel is about to go into captivity when God dwells, tells them. Hosea 1.10 Yet the number of the children of Israel should be as the land of the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered, and shall come to pass. Then the place where he said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. That is a paradoxical scripture, is not? Note the tense of the verb shall be. Shall is, will be, is future to when it was written. Israel is about to go into prison, never to be heard from again. And the Lord tells them that they are going to be numerous beyond count. Furthermore, He tells them that no one will know they are His Israelites. Nonetheless, they will be called the sons of God. Isn't that mystifying? Hosea 2 19 20. And I'll betroth thee unto me forever. I will even betroth thee unto me, and thou shalt know the Lord. Beautiful, right? Betroth is what? Husband wife relationship, right? The Lord then declares that these laws and scattered people will be his bride, a bride whether they know it or not. Impossible for men's standpoint, nevertheless, an accomplished fact from God's. And there is more. If we picture in our minds how seed was sown in the old days, we can also understand this unique Old Testament figure of the soul. Okay. Hosea 2 23. And I will sow her Israel unto me in the earth, and I will mercy upon her that I not obtain mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, that my people, and they will say, Thou art my God. Taking from his bag of grain an ancient farmer will cast seed evenly over every square foot of his field with a sidewise motion of his arm. That's what the Lord did with Israel. He scattered his rights all over his great field the earth, from South Africa to China. Oh my, can you see it? God scattered the seed of Israel over the whole world. From Terra del Fuego to the tip of Siberia. Descendants of the Tos tribes of Israel are everywhere, and God did not disperse them to lose them. In spite of their scattering, the Lord declared that He would have mercy on them. Here at the beginning of the 21st century, it is only a hundred generations from when God made His everlasting covenant with Abraham. Since the very heirs of our heads are numbered, surely the Lord has no trouble remembering every one of Israel's descendants. The prophet Amos also spoke of his continuing his continuing coming with a dispersed Israel but in figurative language. Amos 9 9 For lo I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like his corn is sifted in the sea, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Can we hear that? Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. The creator of the universe was going to save his wayward Israelites. But only them, God and Jesus have a little local plan to do for you Israelites. The Lord saw and planned the history of the whole world and its inhabitants in eternity. Okay? 
and he is very good. Everything God does is good. Do you get it? Now you both, you know why this is such a wonderful reading? I don't know how you feel, but when I first read it, I was really loving this paragraph. In fact, it's probably the first passage of the whole of the book, The False Prophet. You see, this tells us something it tells else. It is about something it tells Joshua or something. No matter how bad the haze will be, no matter how bad our lives will be, even as my leg breaks, always remember, even if the Lord took me away, He is very good. Trust His plan. The Lord doesn't make mistakes. Do you understand that? Do you get that prep tonight? The Lord is good. Everything He does is good. It may look like it's bad, the whole world is going out in flames. That's why people fall away from Christianity like Claire Leon. That's why people cannot see God's prophetic plan. That's why I told you both yesterday. If you understand God's prophetic plan, my dear friends, everything becomes understandable to you. Then you will understand the A to Z of everything. Okay? So, is it reasonable to believe that the Lord scattered the ten tribes of Israel for a good reason? And not just as judgment upon His people? To see why Israel was dispersed, we need to stand outside the 21st century mindset and look back to us 6,000 years of recorded history and understand how God's overall plan. Earlier in this chapter, we saw how bits of the true faith were spread among the primitive peoples of the world. Now let's go to sub point one below. Because parables of prominent historic Israelite figures like Abraham, Moses, and David do not appear in most native religions, Don Richardson, author of Eternity, The Hearts, Peace Child, and Lords of the Earth, questions whether these religions originally sprang from Hebrew roots. But the beliefs of the primitive peoples are passed down from oral tradition over 2,700 years ago that Israel has been dispersed. During their life of time, almost any amount of corruption or omission could have taken place. The importance of the great historic figures would have been lessened as the memory of their deeds was lost in antiquity. If a culture barely remembers that it once had a lost book, it seems unlikely that it would remember who wrote it or what it contained. Precisely, that's why they don't remember the Torah. Do you understand? So those who don't believe this will, of course, you know, they'll say to you, oh, you can't prove it. No, they actually can. Apostate as northern Israel became, it is scripturally provable that there were still men within it who retained the knowledge of God and of His law. Go read 2 Kings 17, 26-28. Taking a broad view of history, it appears that 700 years before Jesus was born, not the 700. Okay. The Lord may have spread the children of Israel over the whole world for the express purpose of sharing the knowledge of the true God with the Gentile nations to prepare the hearts of the people of the world for the coming of Messiah and the preaching of the Gospel. Now we can see a little fulfillment of a verse that is usually spiritualized. Romans 11, 15, 25, 26. Blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles is coming and thus all Israel shall be saved. Do you understand that now? So you see for both of you, did you see God's plan? You see, He allowed the Northern tribes before that there was nobody who understood there was a single God. Yeah, there's none. There's none. If you go look at the Babylonian religions and all the ancient religions of the world, which includes, at this time, Hinduism, which from Babylon, it's multiple gods. So they did not understand the true, one true living God. So what do you do? You let these people, Israel, go first. Okay. The sower, the, the, the farmer, plant the seeds. He put into the, all the nations. So that when the Christians came in with Paul, and went to the Gentile nations, guess what? The girl at the ground really placed in for them. Isn't it amazing? God's plan is incredible. Do you see it now? Everything God does is beautiful. Never doubt it, never doubt the faith. What does the verse say? The Gentiles must come to the law for all Israel to be saved. But when Charles do turn to Jesus, all Israel will be shall be saved. Got that? Do you see that the verse could mean it taken literally? Despite the dispersion of the Nantorn tribes, it could mean that God intended to save the Israelites all along. And in the East Christian era, there's only one way he could do that, so by leading them to the knowledge of his son. Everyone in the church may not be a direct descendant of Jacob, but from Amos 9.9 and other verses we have read, it is reasonable to conclude that the dispersed descendants of Israel are saved and in the church. God damn. Which means, my dear friends, okay, there is every chance that we are related from the northern tribes of Israel. Or maybe even Judah. No matter what the color of your skin or where you are on this planet, you have come to the Lord with a humble heart. It is very possible that you are a physical descendant of one of those ten tribes of Israel. As such, you could be the physical brother or sister of every other believer on earth. Greetings then, my brother or sister, in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Greetings, Joshua, my brother, and greetings, Elizabeth, my sister. Greetings in the name of the Lord. Do you get that passage? In other words, now you may say, but wait, our descendants came from China. Yeah, they also dispersed to China. You don't believe me? Go to one book in Ekaknam. 
the Chinese characters, the Chinese guy is a lexicographer, he wrote a book, he's a Christian. He said how similar the Chinese language was, which talks about the flood. Oh, the Asian Chinese characters. Yes, and you know something, there's actually a similarity. Yeah. So you see, when the Israelites formed for Iran, they were scattered because they were persecuted, right? Not in Iran, beyond Iran. What happened? They would have gone eastwards. China, Japan, Korea. That's where you get the Christians. And then when they went to westwards, later we'll come to the westwards part, okay? You all got it? But anyway, so far he's talked about the eastwards part. That's the northern tribes, except Ephraim. Eastwards will be this tribe. That means we could be from Naphtali, we could be, the, I mean, you both are from Dan, or those tribes, the Gadites, okay? You're from that side. Ephraim will turn west, as you will see later, okay? So, congratulations, huh? We are all brothers and sisters. I believe that. I really do. Ephraim, where are you now? Now, now that we have discussed all this about what happened to the tribe of Ephraim, Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. A story setting for the falling court is with them in Egypt. And this was bad sites 3,700 years ago. The great seven year famine is long past. Jacob is old, full of years. He's almost blind, and now he's about to die. Jacob is so called his twelve children gave around him to give them his final blessings. Joseph and his two sons were ushered in. Okay? First, Joseph heard his boys before him, just as any parent would do when he wants you to notice his children. Actually, I like Alice Schofield's humor. The guy is cute. Actually, you see a video of him talking. I see him is really old now. But I tell you, when he did the video in 19, 2009, it's on YouTube. I did not know this time it's on YouTube. He did a 24 video series. And you go look at him. The man you can see is so simple and humble, even though God gave him all this knowledge. I also feel ashamed. I mean, I'm pretty arrogant with the way I take this. Okay, Genesis 48, 13. And Joseph took both of them from his right hand to Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right hand, and brought them near to him. And Israel stretched out his right hand, and laid up from said, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh said, guiding his hands, wittingly, that means he knew it. But Manasseh was his firstborn. And when he blessed Joseph, and he blessed Joseph, and said, God, before whom your fathers, my fathers Abraham and Isaac, did walk, the God which fed me all my life, gone unto to this day. The angel which redeemed me from all evil, blessed the lads, and let my name be named on them. And the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Midst of the earth, notice that. 17.18 And Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the hand of Ephraim, displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head upon Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. 19. And his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, and he shall become great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Got that? Multitude of nations. Now, a lot of people criticize, because I've seen on YouTube, they say, where is the multitude? There's even books, Christian books, so-called Christian books, saying that Israel... Uh, it's not written by Seventh-day Adventists, believe it or not, but it's other denominations saying that Israel is gone forever. God didn't keep His promise. No, God keeps His promise. This is God's promise. Now, by the way, they say the blessings of the Father, but it's still God's promise. Now, multitude of nations will be what? Western Europe. So the half tribe of Nasseh will become a great people. But according to the future, the half tribe of Ephraim will become a multitude of nations. Okay? Ephraim never did become a multitude of nations in Old Testament times, so they didn't do it before they were taken captive. They'd have to do so after they were absorbed to the Gentile world, right? Obviously, the tribe of Ephraim is not out there claiming to be Israel. So they must not even know who they are themselves. Where has the Lord hidden them? And can it be proven biblically? Or say 11, 89. How should I give thee up, Ephraim? How should I deliver thee, Israel? My heart is turned within me. My repentings are turned together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. Okay? I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee. As a warrior tribe, Ephraim, you see, God is not man. So that's why he says, I will not destroy thee. That's why uh, that stupid farmer and all the seven day Adventists, uh, they need slaps across the face, slaps across the face. I have no sympathy for people who want to continue to promote this idea of anti Semitism. Let them die. Let them die. As the warrior tribe, Ephraim was the most powerful house in Israel. It is. If you read the Old Testament, they always went first many times in battle, besides Judah. In fact, the tribe was so influential that Ephraim's name was sometimes used in reference to all ten tribes. But when the Lord tells us he's not going to give Israel up, he does make a special reference to Ephraim. So Ephraim might have a special prophetic significance. Hosea 11.10 then. then the children of Ephraim shall tremble from the west. They are going to return from the west. And since Israel's lands border the Mediterranean Sea, wherever they are, 
West would have to be the West of the Holy Land itself. Hosea 7 8. Ephraim, he had mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake, not them. That is one of my favorite verses. The tribe of Ephraim is not only mixed among the nations, but it's also a bread not turned. What can that possibly mean? Well, the ancient Israelites baked their bread one side at a time. Something like the pancakes we have today. It took time to bake one side and more time to bake the other. At the time of Hosea, the Lord tells us that only one side of the bread is baked. In other words, Ephraim's history is only half over. You got that, right? For Ephraim's future, the cake would need to be turned and baked on the other side. God is telling us that half of Ephraim's cycle was still future. So this prophecy and that it would take place after the dispersion. So where did God put them? Hosea 9, 13 to 17 excerpts. Ephraim is planted in the pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. O Lord, okay, what will thou give? Now let's look below. Murder in Hebrew, okay, H2026, Harag, okay, Horog, a prim, root, to smite with deadly intent, put to death, make, slaughter, slay, uh, shall bring forth his children to the murderer, slaughter. In Old Testament times, Israel went forth to war. This is probably a figurative reference to warfare or brought to abortion to both. Okay, got that. O Lord, what do thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breast. Yea, they that bring forth, yet will I slay even the beloved fruit of the womb, and they shall be wondrous among the nations. Ephraim will be placed in a pleasant land. When these terrible times text, you see that Ephraim's future will not always be pleasant. A warrior trap still, they will be involved in foreign wars, and many of their children will die unborn either through miscarriage or abortions. So who and where are they? Revelation times identifies Ephraim. The time times and half a time of Daniel were probably 2,500 years. So unless there's a good scriptural reason to disregard the principle, the Revelation times should also be 2,500 years. And the woman Israel was given two wings of a great eagle with the dance and then she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she would be nourished for time, a times and half a time from the face of the serpent Satan. This 2,500 year period cannot be in our future because it can only be one generation, 40 years or so, following the time of the Gentiles. And the time of the Gentiles is over Luke 21, 24 to 32. So to find out what this time fits, when this time fits, we need to lay this 2,500 years of a past history. The last we heard of Israel was when they were taken captive into Syria. Samaria, the capital of Israel, fell in 722 BC. But the major captivity took place about two years earlier, circa 724 BC. Hosea stated Ephraim is mixed with the nations, and his book was written just before the fall of Samaria. Could 724 BC be when Revelation's time, times, and half time began? Okay, now let's go to the point below. The language of the verse does not tie us to the date of the destruction of Samaria. Flying to the wilderness speaks of the dispersion itself and will be applicable to any time between 725 and 722 BC. If so, then this time should lead us to a significant year in the history of Ephraim. 7, 2500 to minus 724 BC is 1776 AD. The United States became a nation. Got that? Are you all clear now? Did you all see that? Okay, now let's go. Third times and half a time are graph number 14. Deuteronomy 427, and the Lord will scatter you among the nations, and shall be left you in number among the heathen. The little Lord shall be you now, Hosea 2, 15 to 16. And I will give her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came out of the land of Egypt. And shall be in that at that day, said the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall no longer call me Bali. Now let's look at that graph of Ephraim dispersed 725 to 72 BC, 2500 years, U.S. Declaration of Independence, 1776 AD. Now note, Ishi for Hebrew is husband, Bali is Hebrew for master. In the Third Testament, the church has a bride, bridegroom in religion law. That's why it tells Ephraim, you will no longer call me Ishi, which is, uh, sorry, uh, Bali. Bali means master. You see, in the Old Testament, they call God Bali. Okay? Master, but in the New Testament, what do you call husband? Isn't that the church? So, isn't Ephraim Christians? Is America the pleasant land where Ephraim was planted? And could the people from all over the world to seek freedom from tyranny and religious persecution be the descendants of those missing tribes? It certainly appears to be a possibility. For years, people have been looking for the United States in prophecy. Now that we have found some evidence that this nation might contain the remnants of Ephraim and the ten tribes or tribes of Israel, do you suppose anyone would want to believe it? Not a chance. Now, he's being uh, Putting a slight joke there, of course, there may be a few of us, but if you're talking about the majority, no chance. Go tell this to all the dispensations, they will never, never, never believe it. Never, not in the 70s, alright? Okay. 
We would rather hang on there with the seven year tribulation view for which there is no biblical or historic evidence whatsoever. But unless we can think of some other incident of major prophetic importance that took place on or about 1776, then the United States become a nation from what the prophecy is about. That makes North America and the United States the pleasant and protected land with the Lord hit Ephraim, Isaiah 9.13, not the dispersion. How most of the children of the ten tribe dispersed tribe migrated to Europe is a story recorded by others, not below one. The white age suggested that the author is using material which is conjectural or lacks real data accreditation, only common historic knowledge, and the Bible itself were used to support the conclusions in this chapter. However, for those interested by pursuing this line of study, here are a few books on the subject. One Man's Destiny, K by the Key, Missing Links Discovered in Assyrian Tablets. Do you know if they found it? They found it on E. Raymond Capt. The Royal House of Britain and Enduring Dynasties, H. Uh, w. H. M. Milner. By the way, do you know that the British royal family found that they actually tried from Israel? They traced it before. They did it. That's why we know it's true. Okay? Suffice to say that the heraldic stingles used by the great houses of Europe had the roots in the tribes Jacob gave his child son. If you question that, ask any authority on heraldry, and what's heraldry? Heraldry is a professional study of art of devising, granting, and blazoning coats of arms, tracing genealogies, and determining and ruling of questions of rank or protocol, etc., by an officer of arms. Okay? The coats of arms that people so proudly hang on their walls are straight out of Genesis 49 1 to 27, when Joseph uh, was blessing the tribes of Israel. You go read it. Um, uh, I mean, no, no, not Joseph, sorry, uh, his father Jacob was blessing the tribes of Israel. And then you go look at it. Uh, he was giving all the children the stuff. He's saying, Ephraim is this. Uh, it's down there. It's like this. Uh, he says something like this. We don't have to spend too much time on this, uh, but you can read it yourself and follow up this chapter. Okay. He says to them all of these things like, um, I'll just give you a brief thing. Brief. Okay. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear the sons of Jacob hearken to Israel. Reuben thou my firstborn and my, the beginning of my strength, excellency of dignity and excellency of power. A stable as water thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. Then the father's thou it. He went up to my couch. Because Reuben slept with one of Jacob's concubines. You know that? He slept. Reuben slept with one of Jacob's concubines. That's why if you look at the symbol of the water, you'll find that it's inside the hurry. This is just one example. You can see the rest. You can see the rest for yourself. All of it. Now, throughout the Christian era, the true saints of God were hunted all over Europe. Just read it. The chronicles of the oppression of the true church during the Middle Ages have been read to believe. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Timon von Brock's, Martyrs Mirror, the Anabaptist record, and broadbands, the Pilgrim Church, record the sufferings of our forefathers in details. Okay, the true Christians had to no settled home in any land and their very lives were continually at risk. They wandered from place to place or were in hiding from persecution. They had a symbolic value of Acho. Acho means trouble throughout the Middle Ages. But the Lord told us it would be like that. Okay? Now what does it say? Hebrews 13, 13 to 14. With no Hebrews is New Testament. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Guess what? Hebrew, isn't it so amazing? This Hebrew remembers by who? Paul. It says, let us go on bearing his reports because God is going to reproach them. We have no continuing cities to be hounded, but we seek one to come. What was the city? The USAFA. Then they cried unto the Lord, and the Lord hid them from the persecutors and planted them in a very pleasant land. It was rich and fruitful and flowing with milk and honey, literally. The new world was just such a land that the United States were founded by Christians fleeing religious persecution. It was. God also told us exactly how that was going to happen. I did this on Sunday, remember? And the serpent cast out his mouth, water, flood after the woman, and he might cause her to be carried away in the flood. And the earth, <coughs> okay, helped the woman <coughs> open the mouth and swallow up the flood, which the dragon cast out his mouth. And the dragons roared for the woman and went to make war with the remnant of the sea, which kept the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus. In the verses above, we read that Satan will try to destroy the Jews in the church with a flood of people. Now, point one below. Waters is figurative language for many people's Revelation 17 15. I did this with all before. And he said to me, The waters with our souls, with the whole city of our peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Okay? But the Lord separated the remnant church and many Jews from the enemies by the Atlantic Ocean. That country grew and prospered and became the hub of the Western world. West West, 
We haven't heard them before. This hemisphere is as far west as you can get. Go any further, it's called the Far East. Hosea 11 to 10 to 11, 10 to 11 Exodus. They shall walk after the Lord. Then the children shall come from the west, and I will place them in their homes, save the Lord. Got that? Brilliant, isn't it? Furthermore, the church, like the Levites, is called to be priests and to come out of the world. I did that with God before. Revelation, okay? 1, 6, 5, 10, 18, 4 to 5. First Peter, all this is all, you can check it out later. God called Levi to be directly in the Lord's service as priests. They were separated from the rest of the people. God even gave them special cities to live on. on Numbers 35 to 6, 7. Cities which shall give the Levites shall be 40 and 8 cities. Them shall you give with their suburbs. Check it out. The Levites had 48 cities. The continental United States has 48 cities. It was not until after the people of 1948. Notice 48 again. There we two mix ourselves with the nations. Hosea 7, 8. And states outside the borders were added, which includes what? Hawaii and okay, Alaska. You got that? It was not until after 1948 that the United States began to lose its influence as a Christian lighthouse of the world. Occasional inconsistencies happen, but are all these historic fits just random chances that by some fluke of mathematical magic just happen to fit scripture? That would be difficult for any thinking person to swallow. Here are another couple of coincidences on just. The Lord gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. Until the last decade, babies were routinely circumcised in the United States. Why else? There's no sound medical reason for this practice. 2. The United States was the first nation to have a five-day work week, thus observing the Sabbath as well as Sunday. 3. Though Jacob had only 12 sons, Joseph's two sons became two tribes. Counting Ephraim and Anna said there were then actually 13 tribes. In America, there were only 12 colonies, but the Carolinas were too large to govern in horse and buggy days. So the Carolinas were split into two states, North and South Carolina. So, as Israel's 12 sons became 13 tribes, our 12 colonies became 13 states. Did you get that? You can check U.S. history, but he's not talking nonsense. Did you see how God paralleled it? Now, you know why God paralleled it like Elizabeth and Joshua? He wanted people to identify him. But you know what's the sad part about it? People won't. I think until the time of few, few people like Alice Schofield, most people didn't notice that. All that was long ago. Since then, the United States has fought a half dozen wars. World War One, World War Two, Korean War, Vietnam War, Gulf War, Afghanistan War, not seven, Iraq War, Iraq War. By the way, it's also seven. Notice that now it's seven. And last, bringing a fourth children fought to the murder as though foretold in Hosea 9.13 and now through many full abortions we also bring our children fought to the murder in a new and savage way however terrible as it may sound God's eternal plan is still on children brilliant isn't it? see a man can do whatever he wants but God will never be defeated Ezekiel 2 sticks now just before Ezekiel describes the battle of Armageddon the 30, 30 and 39 chapters of this book his book he tells of the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land in the vision of the dry bones, the valley of dry bones. Maybe one day I should do that for you all, explain to you all in detail. Noting the context, these dry bones are fulfilled in Israel 19 for Ezekiel 37, 11 to 12. Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore, prophesy to them that say the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves. I will cause you to come out of your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. Beautiful, isn't it? Armageddon falls closely at the heels of this prophecy. How soon will that battle be? End time pundits notwithstanding, scripture doesn't seem to say. Very soon, I guess. Very soon. However, because of where we are in history, we can now cross reference to this dry bones with one of Daniel's final prophecies and get a time key. And at that time shall Michael stand out, the great prince which stand up for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. At that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting light and some to shame and everlasting content. As the Lord put flesh in the dry bones lying in their graves, Ezekiel 37, 11. Okay. So those who slept in the dust awoke to be restored to the Holy Land, Daniel 12, 1 to 2. Same event, different figurative language. As an interesting side note, God tells us that all who come to life return to Israel would not be believers. However, despite the spiritual condition, the Lord is assembling the forces that are going to make a stand for him in the final battle. So you see, I want to put this one clear. 
about people like long ago people asked me look, how come Israel is not Christian so why is they saved you got to understand the value of dry bones he says I'm going to put my spirit in the last days but first there was no spirit there was only the sinews of the bones in other words God says they're not going to be spiritually Christian or even Orthodox Jews get that point very straight there's no Holy Spirit initially but you know how many Jews in these last days are turning to Christ you know that they are in terms of percentage one of the top five nations in terms of turning to Christ, besides Iran and Afghanistan and Pakistan. So you've got to understand that the Lord is working a mighty hand right now. We can't say it, but He's doing it. Who are we to judge them? That's why when Seventh day Adventists say that God has done away the Jews forever, can you imagine? You know what they're saying? They're saying that God's a liar of all this. Can you imagine what will happen to them on Judgment Day? You know that it will be shown to them that they are the liars. And you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 36? When they are found alive, they are dead. It's lake of fire. That's why I know Seventh-day Adventists cannot be saved. It cannot be saved. Okay. Ezekiel 37, 16. Moreover, thou son of man, take one thou one stick, and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick, and write upon it for Joseph. The stick of Ephraim and for all the house of Israel, his companions. All agree that the above is an anti-vision. Simply stated, Ephraim and the ten northern tribes are one stick, while Judah, the Jews, is the other. Okay, you got that right? As you look about us now, something wonderful is happening to both the Jews and the Ten Lost Tribes. Something we've been waiting for to see for 2,700 years. Isaiah 11.13 The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Now why? The Jews aren't really, those Judah are not envied by the Christian Church. And right now, Judah is not going to back safe from fact we're standing together. Before the end, the Lord will take the stick of Abraham, now in the true church, and unite the stick of Judah. We will be one stick in God's hand, Ezekiel 37 19. Say unto them, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel as follows, and I will put them with him, even the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. The place that God plans to take one stick, one people, of Israel and Judah again. He is going to heal the division between them and draw them together. Within this generation, the Christians will be united with the Jewish people and will be one people again, the Israel of God. Are we up to the task? Of course not. Well, like that's the chasm, that's true. But now that our hearts can be opened to who Ephraim and Judah are, we can just begin to see what our end time roles will be. Zechariah 9 13. When I bent Judah for me, filled the bowl with Ephraim, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy son. By the way, O Greece, ah. you know what Greece is? Greece is not Greek. In for Elizabeth and Joshua, Greece is, you know who? Turkey. The sons of Yovan. It's the Seleucid Empire, Yovan. Okay, because the actual scripture says Yovan. Yovan. Yovan is the Seleucid Empire of the Greeks, which means Turkey, Syria. Got that bad iron leopard. And make thee as a sword of the mighty man. Now, do you know that a lot of Jews are now immigrating that day? I saw the internet, they say Israel is not even having place for them. They're going to make new homes and make new homes for settlers. Guess what? God is bringing Ephraim back. Can you see it now? Do you get it? Do you know that Ethiopian Jews are coming back to Israel? Do you know that Russian Jews are coming back to Israel? Look at how God did it. He's brought back the ten tribes. What is it? One more time. And this is the last time. Judah now back in the Holy Land, but I have only one true ally, Ephraim and the Gentile Church. We are the only candidate left in the world in the title of the stick of Joseph. The days when the United States was a trustworthy ally to Israel are swiftly Okay. Coming to them. Of course we know who the leader is, Barra Obama. Yeah. But not all Gentiles are lost tribes, yeah. No, you got to understand that. The thing it is, we will never know until Judgment Day, but I have a feeling that the Lord had planned. That's why I said to you all along. Long, okay, I hear this. Passing as our governmental leaders bend to the wishes of the so-called Arabs, called themselves Palestinian Muslims, and did all glory to flight into the inescapable tapet of Islamic world. There's only a remnant of the true church left in any Western land now. As scripture opens before us, we can see that the remnant Maybe from the lost tribes of Israel, whom Satan has always hated, Revelation 12:17. 17. 
Don't be lulled to sleep, folks. If the Lord doesn't provide a way of escape, physical persecution is close at hand for Christians everywhere. Revelation 12, 11 to 12. And they were given with the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of the testament, they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, with the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that they have a short time. So, with 1948 and 1967 pondits, in those years, the new nation of Israel was born. At the time of the two inners came to an end. Jerusalem was free, and all days equals years and time times were fulfilled. We are now in the end times, the final generation. And God is assembling his forces for the hour of trial. Revelation 3.10 and the Battle of Armageddon. The true church is part of those forces and the other parties, of course, the Jews. The Jews are the others. So you see Elizabeth and Joshua. You've got to understand all this. I hope it will build your faith up tonight. Now, first thing it is, we can argue until the cows come home, but it's not important because at the end of the day, whether all Gentiles are descendants of Jews is not important. But I would prefer to know because my ancestors are from Norway. And there could be a very good chance because I do care for the Jews. I really wish I could fight for them. Maybe there's a spiritual bonding, you never know. The genetic thing that's hidden in us. But you see, at the end of the prayer, I'm trying to say something. He's trying to say something rather than me. Please understand your role. We are part of that one stick. Two sticks will be made into one people. And we're going to fight alongside them on Armageddon. You got that? But isn't that so comforting? Now, I'll tell you what is I like about this reading more than anything else. You see, Two things, no, two things. Number one, God still forgave his wayward people. His love will never die. If we just did what we did, he wanted us to do, you really think he won't forgive us for our sins? Even though we may not have the best of preparation, even though we may have done things that are wrong in the past, the Lord will forgive. But you see, you got to also make sure it doesn't mean you take it like uh, the Carl's way of uh, one save, all we save. No, that's, that's wrong. That's testing the Lord. And testing the Lord is that amount of death. But what I'm trying to say to you both is this tonight before we close for the final prayer. Number one, the Lord loves you. He doesn't want you in the lake of I'm pretty sure of that. The Lord gathered. You see, Joshua, if you think carefully, who brought you to our service? I mean, if you really think and analyze it, this is the Lord's hand doing because sometimes he uses evil uh, people to accomplish his goal, like Pharaoh or whatever, okay, or Nazi Germany to persecute the Jews in order to bring it. So he's got a plan for you. How about Elizabeth? You do not remember this, you're too young and you probably don't remember. When your brother's in primary three, there was a time when your mother wanted to stop tuition. You do not know this, you can't remember. I have great memory of this kind of thing. Your mother felt that it was not, uh, she wanted to save money. I remember the time, that's what you both told me, but it could have been another reason. Maybe she felt the results weren't good enough. But your mother wanted to stop tuition. Then Kenneth said to me, or oh, we'll see what happened. Then later on, your mother can decide to continue at primary four, and you were primary three. But at the end of primary three, when you were in primary two, when that time was Winnie the Pooh, there was a problem because Winnie quit tuition. And Isaac, uh, your tutor's son, I think his name is Isaac, something like this. Uh, so, because both quit, then your mother also probably wanted to stop. Maybe they were saying, hey, it's not a really good tutor or whatever. I don't know, but. If you think carefully, all these years, your mom still maintained. You did drop out of tuition eventually. You only came back for your O-level uh, when I offered you the free tuition. You came back. You think carefully. Don't you realize that God has kept you in our church because of our purpose? So you both can see the bigger picture now. Number one, God has a plan for you. You're part of his plan. Don't doubt it. If you doubt it, I tell you something, you're a very big fool. Because at the end of the day, you're just going to kill yourself when you have a chance of salvation. It's number one. Two, Remember one thing, we're going to stand with Israel. Don't ever, ever let people tell you otherwise. There is a plan and God does everything very good. So even when you see the persecution, even if an MRT blew up in Singapore, even if the skies were completely dark with smoke from Indonesia, even in the hour of temptation when the skies are dark with nuclear suit, it doesn't matter. Like today I sent an SMS to Deborah, I said, you know, I'm not, it's not a great day, but with the faith, Will the Lord be praised? You know why? This shows us the end is coming. Yes, it does. Why? The haze is the worst. It's all the worst, the worst, the worst. We know we're accelerating towards the camp. And you know, when we look at the news today, you know how many people do not know the news? How many people do not know the news that Chinese troops are coming into Syria? How many people do not know the truth that Syrian airspace now, the Russians are going to try and block it? They're going to try and make a bubble. Okay, they're trying to uh, allied things and stop bombing them. 
because I think they want to protect Sirius Assad but maybe they have other plans and you know they just don't want their neighbours to be bombed okay and then you see Iran's massive troops along the Golan Heights and Russia is just allowing that to happen so they're telling Israel don't hit them in Syria so you see Russia is playing the big brother but the Muslims are just using them they're riding on them trust me Iran doesn't want anything to do with Russia they are Muslim, they hate the infidels and Russians are orthodox, they are pagan worshippers the hearts of Iranian leaders, they hate the Russians because they are called infidels and Russians are paganists because they are also worshipped Mary, statues and all that try to understand, Rouhani isn't friends with Putin he appears to be that only for his goal once Russia clears the airspace and everything then you see Turkey, now Turkey is getting pissed off Turkey wants to get involved so Turkey are now trying to establish a buffer zone in Syria to protect the people. Basically, they're just giving excuse to come inside. So you can see all this is accelerating to the end. Iranian troops are now in Syria fighting against ISIS. They will move on to Israel. Russian troops are there. Although they're claiming nothing, actually, they're talking rubbish. They just want to say because it will lead to a jihad, a big blah blah. Obama, the Muslim, is sidelined. So he you know, will have to be circumcised in his mouth and his face and everything else. So basically, you'll see all of it is going to be destroyed. Now you will see it's coming to the end. Iran is the bomb. Now the question is how long more will this last? Maybe one year, maximum three. But as everything points to the 70, the Shemitah, UN General Assembly 70th year, it points to a lot of things. I think this is the last, it's the running. And too many things are happening, it's hard to see that it will not, it will keep. And by the way, if you read today the Straits Times, uh, didn't state it in the open front page, but I only saw in the middle pages the world's economy is on the verge of collapse. Really, you know there's a run. Markets are taking a battery in Australia, in China, in Taiwan. They are really taking a battery. The world's economy is on the brink of collapse. It only takes one day, like October, I can't remember the date, but there's an October date in 1987, the great crash. Stock market took one day, millions and billions were wiped out. And I can tell you, it can happen. And the world's debt, you know last time I told you all 2 trillion, no 200 trillion, it's now 230 trillion. You know that this has to be paid out sooner or later. So the debt is going to be on the pink of disaster. So once the old debt comes in, people are panicking. You will see absolutely no mayhem. Now one more thing, how about us? Try to understand God's prophetic plan, just hold on. Actually it's a pity because I know Deborah really wants to do it. Kenneth couldn't be bothered about us, Kenneth. But Deborah, I know would have wanted to be here today. Um, did you all record it? No. Yeah. Okay, good. First of all. So you can send it a file. Actually, I wish I had this technology right. I can't believe I'm actually saying it now. But uh, maybe it's time I bought myself a smartphone. <laughs> I can't believe I should slap myself tonight. I can't believe I'm saying it never. I criticize the smartphone so much. You know right, you're in my own level, I bash it so much. Now, for the first time I realize Maybe it would be good to have a smartphone with an internet connection so I don't have to wait until I get to the office to look at the internet. But then again, uh, I look at the cost of a smartphone. Uh, whew, it can blow my face away. Boy. Forget it, forget it. I don't have that money for a smartphone. <sighs> if I buy a smartphone, it would die for me. Especially if it's a good one, like me, like iPhone, because I know iPhone is 6 plus is the best. If I buy it, I'm putting a gun on it, forget it. And I think the bills must be pretty heavy, but when you surf the net, should you die standing? Okay, now let's close off. I want to say this, uh, please hang on. I think we need to talk to our group as a group on Sunday. Maybe Sunday I'll end a little bit earlier. But we really need to talk to our group with a translator for the sake of Sarah and for Julian. But most importantly, we need to straighten people out, including one client who is doing his very best to follow in the footsteps of Kenneth Hagen and Kenneth Copeland. I can't believe that someone would actually have such pride and such determination to follow in the footsteps of those two clowns, but unfortunately we have someone in our church who is proud to do that, you see. But we have to get one thing very straight. The coming to the hour of temptation is very close. You can get it, you know, the feeling is this, as things get worse, the skies go darker, the smoke. Uh, I showed him yesterday one video you know, about the world burning. Remember that one I showed him my O level? It's done by Hockey Davis Channel, his latest video, I'll tell you. Whew, you see it. Jaw drop really black around the world, burning in many places on fire. And my Bible Lord says the fire will come. This, by the way, it's not the fire he's referring to. God will burn the world in another fire. But what he's saying is that this is a prelude. 
you know like a prelude to something that means like a movie you have a coming soon it's just like a prelude to something so the fire that we're seeing around the earth now burning forests in indonesia kalimantan northern borneo the fires that we're seeing in california we're seeing in nevada they're just the the lord giving a preview of the final destruction it's like a preview okay try to understand that the lord has always got and by the way he's giving us the signs to say to the people look the earth is going to be burned by fire some christians got it i see the comments on the video they got it but only a few of us i wish i can make contact with more of these christians are so few but it's so sad you know we've got so few people that are christians in singapore and then you got all those chantel the sky the jolene the catherine the valerie's these people also they need a slap they need a slap had they agreed with our doctrine they stood with us like wang yang you know that our number would be bigger now they would have told more people more people would have known the truth but nah they refused you know, they said it, nah, you know, you can't say it. They are real retards, real retards. I know my language is very unchristian, I know, because I was reading Ephesians. But I can't help but disliking these people so much. What they did is really wrong. I mean, okay, uh, you know, you, you fall down, okay, let's say you play football, you work someone or what. That isn't a spiritual thing, but what they've done is worse. They kept others in the darkness, and they kept themselves in the darkness. You know how many things that you have learned in this church? Can you imagine what would have happened if you were not in this church? You should thank God. Don't ever thank me. Don't ever thank me. Please, at one. I, I shudder to think if I take credit from God, I, that I was thinking, oh, I can imagine burning the lake of fire for doing that one. So I'd rather you all give God credit. But thank the Lord. You know a lot more of the Bible than all the contemporaries. I mean, while farm is uh, farting through the mouth, you know, with his rubbish, you all can look back at all that you have learned and you know the Bible so much better. Can you imagine you both? You actually know the Bible better than some pastors. Think about it for a while. Sit down tonight and reflect. If you really studied all these and went back and did follow up, you actually know the Bible in some ways better than pastors. Especially in prophecy. Understanding about Hosea now, you know it better. And seeing the prophecies of the 1260 years. See? God is great to you all. But what do you have to do for Him? Love Him. Do what He wants you to do. Isn't that so simple of course it's not that easy to do when you are faced with all the shit like today the two boys you know yesterday they showed the middle finger you know i hate that i hate that from children okay i used to show the middle finger i mean i'm not gonna lie i did it in the army but these children are 11 years old please this is not national service man okay it's wrong in the christian context but it's even worse when you get 11 year old idiots paria dogs doing it the middle finger and you know just now they said about the mother you know, they used the bad words that you know like the mothers think that one is smelly. Uh, you know what thing I don't want to repeat. Uh, it's a Christian thing tonight. They're very disgusting. You know? Very disgusting animals. Uh. They're so dirty and so low that they will stop to the lowest denominator. They're very disgusting. Their mouths are full of sewer shit. You know? I mean, I was like that before. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But not at that age. Not 11. In St. Stephen's, a lot of things we are perplexed. We didn't even know. When the dog sometimes talk, we like, oh, what is this? He did not know. Only later, my generation, my batch will learn, like some pets, maybe set trees at four, we grow up, yeah, start learning these kind of things. Then, when all those kind of bad words, like for example, like uh, the cow pay, bad word, that kind of thing, right? That kind of thing, we will know even the army time. I first heard that one, and I fully understood it in the army. I first heard it in the army. And I know these guys are using today, they say your mother is the kabu, they can't start with your son. I was like, oh my god, they are talking when, you know, 11 years old bloody paria dogs now. I reached army, I think 20. Yeah, 20. And they put paria dogs now, real paria dogs are using bad words like, oh, I can't do something. But I tell you, by the way, I'm just giving you the, the minor ones, uh, the, the more heavier ones. Uh, uh, things that only nine division people would use because look at nine division where I was we are tremendously good in bad words. I don't know why but it's something we used to be proud of but I don't be proud of anymore. My nine division was an exporter of bad words in Singapore really. Some of the worst bad words you can get in the Singapore forces stems from nine division. They're not just using it, they import it into other camps. Nine division got bad words and even Indian bad words, Tamil bad words. You know. And you know they use the bad words, even got a Japanese bad word. Yeah saying something about prostitution but it's a long story for another time but then tell you, you know and these guys 
it's almost as if they want to surpass nine division. They're trying to be, you know, like we were master's degree in Bible in nine division. They want to be PhD. They already want to be PhD doctorate. No? I mean, they are incredible. When I listen to them today, I told them, hey, shut up. I don't use the bad words. I was very angry. I was typing on the computer the receipt. The bad words they use are staggering, you know. Staggering bad words, you know. I was like, goodness gracious me, man. My some bad boys didn't use it. Some bad boys were using the common bad words like FUCK or the PASTRD, the kind of common English bad words. They already upgraded, man. And they upgraded to the the one which they say the, the, the mother thing is ripped apart. I mean, they even know the kind of bad words are like, Hey, I only learned that army, man. These guys are incredibly disgusting. They are completely shockingly disgusting. And the way they talk, I tell you that dirt, the filth. It's incredible. I mean the joke is a joke. Okay, they sing about the JJ, you know, farting or whatever, because it parts all the time. By the way, I got a student last year, no joke. His name is JJ Jun I shorten it JJ. The guy lets out gas at least eight times in one less than two hours, and I'm not joking. Really lets out gas. And by the way, uh, he's one that smells, he's methane, he's like nuclear fusion. Right? It's really scary. Right? You know, the whole room will be covered with smell. I gotta even tell him after walking, please get out and fart. But to come back to what I'm saying, right? the things they were saying just now are shocking. And then you got our good old Kenneth Copeland Hagen saying, oh no, 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 the kids now are saying, you know, the child is deluded. Right? That means he really cannot see the signs. But whatever it is, uh, we don't criticize him anymore. I just wanna leave him alone. I want to move on to the last day. We already got enough fights. Of course, I'll try to straighten him out. I'm going to do it this Sunday. And you just remind me, uh, I'll straighten him out this Sunday. I'm going to tell him straight to his face. Like, someone got to give it to his face. If not Sunday, then maybe Saturday. Maybe Saturday, we come for prayer. I'll say it after they go home. I'll say it shortly, but I got to say it to his face. I think you are doing nothing for a group. You're really doing nothing. If you really don't want to be part of the Lord, then, then just you can come as a guest. I mean, there's nothing wrong coming as a guest, like Sarah. Right, right. But we don't include you on anything. That means you don't do the announcements at the beginning, you know. You just become an appendage. Just like a guest. You know I mean? But I don't need to say the announcements until he gets straight to the world. Because I don't because I told Amos that time my church is very good, you know, we don't have clowns parading and all that. And then we got one joker parading at the start of service for what? Then I'm a hypocrite myself, I'm not even keeping to what I said I want to do. But what I just tell you is that we must be united. Like for example, I know that my mother irritated me. By the way, I saw today the Pope saying that Jesus says stuff. I'm going to give it to her. We have to stand up for the Lord. Even no matter how many times we are isolated, we stand up. Look, just a little one more, that's all, it's over. Time out, we got heaven on its own. But by the way, uh, trust what we're doing. Trust what we do. Don't follow the rule of the majority of Christians. They're not saved. By the way, the question is, is uh, how come the majority of Christians are saved? They may be Gentiles without Jewish roots, number one, and two, maybe, maybe. It still means that the Father in heaven can throw his children in hell. Or the little Father, he does, he said it. He said it. When they say all Israel will be saved, please try and understand one thing. I also take it as figurative language. You know what? When he told Nebuchadnezzar, he says he will rule all the nations of the earth. It's not literal, it's hyperbole. I told you all before. So they say all Israel, what, I, what it probably meant was all Israel is in, at least somebody in all 12 tribes will be saved. That's why you have the 12,000 from Judah, the 12,000 from this, got it? So there'll be, Israelites are saved. Okay, all the tribes, they'll be saved. All Israel, there'll be no tribe left out. By the way, it's interesting to know, do you know that Christian missionaries have gone to Myanmar and started converting the Iran, Karen? I knew that part, but I didn't know about the Yalu so far. That's why I don't know. But you know something, God made them in such a way, they all knew about the Yapa. And you see now you get Christian missionaries going to Bangkok making them Christians. And why are they turning to Christianity? Because they already all along believe in Yahweh. That's why I say God's plan is amazing. Okay? That's why you see a lot of Indians also know, turning to Christ. It will be part of the Roma. You never know. But you see, and Chinese people are turning to Christ also. That's why I say to you both, tonight when you're going back, whether you're traveling by train for Elizabeth or bus for Joshua, just reflect this a little while. Don't look at your handphone or what. Just reflect this for a little while. Can you see where our God is such an amazing God? His plan is tremendously great. And what Alice Cofield's truth says, everything the Lord does is good. And that Pope, forgive the language, but that bastard says that his life was a failure, he's failed at the cross. I'll show you the video, you want to show you? And the, and the best part, the guy holding the microphone, the bastard, quoting word for word. So it's not a misunderstanding, it was shown worldwide, live television or Fox News. That bastard, 
calling out Christ a failure, that stupid antichrist bastard, let him burn. I like what Christ, Christian said, his hide will be burning the lake of fire. I also put what? I said his name Pope should become poop. As in poop, you know what I mean? Not poop, like shit. I put what my comment. So if I haven't got responses, I gave it to him. I don't know how many likes I get, but I hope I get a lot. But that bastard is like, how nice is the Lord? While he's giving one sermon, the Lord will send fire on hell, from heaven and consuming in front of the now. <laughs> Burning like the old man. Watch him just burn. But that bastard is a bastard. Real bastard. Real, I hate these guys. That Pope, uh, if Christians say we got to love these kind of people, I say those can, can go and suck it. They can suck eggs, you know? they can take quail's eggs and suck it. I tell them they go and die. Anyone who says we have to love that bastard is talking shit. We don't have to love our enemies. When they talk about enemies, it may be enemies within the church. Maybe they may become Christians one day. But the point is that he's our spiritual enemy, he's an enemy of God. We don't love the enemies of God. That's why the guy's a bastard, a real bastard. When he said that, I saw the video of some Christians you should see. I will show you the video tomorrow, then you read the comments below. The Christians said when they saw, one Christian said, I was so shocked. Man. I almost fell off my chair. Even Christians, man, not Catholics, man, were shocked. You know. They said, we know the Pope is bad, but we never expect him to get to this level. Man. This is the lowest level. Man. This is Satan's level already. It's that level. He, the guy's a bastard. And you know what's the worst part of the video? I commented, I was the only one who commented about the last part of the video. I said, see the retards clapping them. After he finished that part of the sermon, you look at the Catholics, no? clapping loudly, no? clapping, you know, those bastards. They are also bastards. And they were not like shocked, like, huh? What did he just say? And by the way, they knew what he said. He said it in Latin, he got a guy who interpreted. The guy was next to the microphone in black. So the Catholic bishop was actually interpreting in English. So the man understood what he said. It was in St. Patrick's Church in New York. And then the bass, oh, the bass is clapping their hands, oh, woo, right, you know, the way, like, rock concert, oh, and it was loud, you know. That means not, like, like, courtesy clap, no. You know, like, MOE, sometimes we go talk, we hear it very boring, we just, no. Clapping loud, no, like, shaking the head, like, yes, look at what he said, no. When I look at the last part of the video, the last part of, I knew the Pope would say that, the last part of the video was, to me, worse than the first part of the video, because they're clapping hands. I was waiting to see if any Catholic was, like, shaking the head over, like, huh? None, no. The audience were clapping as the video showed, the camera showed them. Clapping their hands, those bastards. No. All those, and I said, every Catholic, I wrote down in my comment, we'll end off in the lake of fire. Every Catholic is a bastard. Every Catholic is a bastard. They will burn the lake of fire. Okay. They burn the lake of fire. Catholics are certified, bona fide bastards. I hate their guts. But if a Catholic wanted to change, I say, welcome, brother. Welcome to the true church of God. But the ladies are the guy, such a bastard, certified bastard. By the way, people will now say, how about dispensationalism? Doesn't this show the Pope is the Antichrist? They're saying now they're wrong. The Pope is the distractor. You see, the Pope knows he's a distractor. So all this leads Christians to think the Pope is there, while Islam is gaining ground. And many Christians are becoming Muslims. So they didn't see the real enemy, is it? Satan is a master of these guys. He did it. He got a, a patsy, a lackey called the Pope, or Poop. To do all this shit, so people think he's the Antichrist, and Barack Obama is lucky kissing his ass. So all this makes people look at that direction, but they don't see the Middle East as the problem. They don't see Iran. I even got so-called Christians writing poor Iran, poor Iran. Can you believe it? These people are bastards, also they're bastards. Lord forgive me for my language tonight, but I really hate these bastards. I tell you, I hate them with my passion. I hate them. And I'm going to tell Jacqueline the next time she calls me, I'm going to rip her to pieces. I'm going to tell her, you want to meet me, Ken? We will normalize. I'm going to lie for this. I'm going to lie. So you will normalize relations, but you just have to meet more than I will bring her here, where she can't run. At home, she can run. Because my house, she can run. Then we lock the door. Then you guys lock the door. I'm going to tear her to pieces. Tear that, tear that. I'm going to show the video and tear that Catholic bitch to pieces. I hate to say she's my mother. She must be ripped to pieces. I'm going to show the video. Like I say, you are a liar to the face in front of your, your witnesses. I'm going to rip her to pieces. And then she's going to get it. I'm going to tear her to pieces. Because I hate the people who are workers on the I really hate them. They say, don't hate the sinner. Sinner may be Christian sinner. Wow. That's a different sinner. is also Christian and sin. They did not say love the heathen. Where does the Bible say we have to love the heathen? They're twisting that verse. They said love the sinner. 
Who's the sinner? The sinner is who's in the church. That's what Paul said. Some of you are sinning in the church. That's what it means. The sinner is who? The Christian in the church. It does not say love the heathen, love the pagans, no. But this is going too far. And by the way, people will say, how about you shouldn't tell that? Are they not Christians but just sinning and misled? No, no, no. They are not they are sinning with intent. They are pagan religionists, quasi pantheists. Those jokers are different. They want to sin. They want to acknowledge the sinfulness of that. And they love all those doctrines. They are but of hypocrites. They need to be slapped, heavily slapped a hundred times over. Try to understand the Bible. These people are not Christians, they're really pagans. Okay? But remember this, we must stick together. Time is running out. But I really hate them, you know. They make Christianity have a bad name. You see, Christianity itself is beautiful. Christians are a light to the world, the Gentiles. They are tremendously good people. And even the enemies of Paul, all that would have respected these people as, you know, they would have feared them and respected them for their, their, their religiosity, for their cleanliness. America was the Christian lighthouse of the world. Then you get all these clowns, Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, you get D.D. Drake, Benny Hinn, Laura White, all these bastards, Kreffler, Dollar. You get them spoiling the name of Christianity. That's why they need to be burning and burning and burning to an eternity together with the Muslims. They need to be burning. We cannot have sympathy for these people. What are we saying if we have sympathy for these people? Are we saying that God's judgment is wrong? Then we are saying, oh, poor thing sent to the lake of fire. So can you imagine Jesus saying, oh, you with the goats? Lord, shouldn't it be a... Can you imagine saying on judgment day? But the Bible said you must have pity for them, what? No, that's not a contradiction. There will be no pity for these bastards because they deserve to be burning in the lake of fire. Can you see it now? I hope tonight we are clear. I'm so glad tonight we are here. And I, I praise the Lord that I don't have an hour's lesson. So tonight we have spent, I hope you don't mind, I spent one and a half hours. I hope it's edifying for you. You've learned a lot about God's true eternal plan. Please know where your station is. We are not here to be, we are here to be in one stick together with Judah. You understand? In the hand of the Lord. Two sticks, one stick with Judah. Judah is our brothers and sisters in Israel now who are suffering every day. Every day. Believe me, they have to suffer silence, the fear of walking to bus stops, knowing that the Palestinians may take out a knife and stab them. They're having a really bad time of it. But you see, the Lord's plan is this. He's bringing them closer to Him. So at the end of the day, understand the word of the Lord. Okay? But for us, uh, please stand together. We've only got four plus one old lady who's frail, who's, who may die any day. I hope not. But having said that, I also say this. I'm a realist. God's plan is perfect. If God wants to keep up, I shut my mouth up if he wants her to go to the last day. If God wants to take her now, let her go in peace and then go to heaven. I say, Heavenly Father, praise the Lord. She hasn't got to go through the trial, our condition. Of course, if she's with us, we take care of her. But the most important thing is that Shirley is 13, we mustn't let Shirley go. Someone's got to go through this with Shirley. I don't have that kind of time. I spend a lot of time on Friday. People are asking me for the work, it was I'm working, it was I'm working. And even though he knows, a lot of things I don't mark. I really cannot stand it. People are putting pressure on me and i got to make my business grow. I don't see new students coming in. I only got one in the last one month. So i got to you all. I hope you all understand. I need you all to also push the issue for me. I can't just keep pushing it alone. And I know you both have been doing something, but you got to really push it. Ensure the number of cups are there, number of utensils. Get your departments running very smoothly. Like last Saturday, I think Joshua may have asked Kenneth to move the tables or what. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, when I was closing the lights, then only it starts shifting two tables. Now switch out the lights, I'm about to go. Then he may have realized. Did you ask him to close the tables? Mm-hmm. Saturday? No, I didn't know he was coming. No, but the joker, just before switching out the lights, he realized he had to do something. He started putting the two tables. That's why the two tables in the room was done by him. But, but I'm not switching out the light now. But that was mm, not properly. I know. I know, but the point is he was trying to do it last minute. So. But I was pissed. I was thinking you want to do, and the time you're not, you're sitting down waiting for me, you know, because I was switching off the, the cleaning water. He's sitting down, sitting his ass, and doing nothing. And then finally when he realized after I was switching off everything, he noticed that the table's not done, and he starts to do something. In the dark. Maybe he wants to become part of the dark, darkness, I don't know. I can't stand it, you know, I mean, his blooming mindset is really sucks. You know. Doesn't he understand that he's coming to the end? And with the kind of crimes that he's committed, the heinous crimes, he should be the most desperate among us. Okay, I committed higher crimes because I'm 46. Okay, I've dated and I've done stupid things in the past before I was baptized. I agree. Okay? But the point I'm trying to say is that for the love of God, this joker doesn't realize that time is running out. He's been largely lukewarm. This is the last chance for him to do something good. 
show the law that he tried to put in some effort at last, not superficial tokenism. But for us, uh, please hold on. Please hold on as brothers and sisters. Learn to love each other, not just like each other. Learn to love each other. Learn to support each other. Find out what each other is suffering. Like Josh, I mean like uh, Deborah is having a hard time with Julia now because she's very sick. Give her some comfort, even a short SMS. That's why sometimes in the morning, I always never fail to SMS Deborah. Never fail to SMS at night before she sleeps. I said, the Lord will lead you home. Just keep prodding and encouraging each other because the end time is going to be very black. Just do that to each other, okay? That's why sometimes I SMS you all also say, no. Keep pushing on. Push and push because you've only got a short while left. After that, it's over. We leave it to the Lord, okay? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, tonight we're done a great session. We have Joshua, Elizabeth, myself. The chapter on Mormon time is tremendous. Please help us to understand the prophetic picture of the Lord and understand what we have to do and what is our role in this prophetic picture of the Lord. Help us to understand and not lose sight of this prophetic picture. Dear Lord, we pray for your people in Israel that they will be protected, that all Israel will be saved indeed. Dear Lord, also we pray for the Christians worldwide, those who are suffering persecution, those who have enemies like Tim Conway, those who are criticized like Paul Washington, those who are in prison like Tim Davis, the four Christians in the Iranian prison. We pray, dear Lord, that all this will be dealt with. You will give them strength, and you will give us strength, the Lord, to see out the last days. This we pray in Jesus' most glorious and mighty name. Amen. I tell you, I really forget the language, but I really hate those.